It's great to have such a full house. This is our second presentation in our new pop-up space. For those of you who don't know, we used to be right around the corner in a bigger space. And in about a year and a half or two years, we'll be in an even bigger space somewhere else. But for today, we're here. We're delighted that you're all here with us for such a wonderful event. My name's Cindy. I'm the director of MoMath. It's always a pleasure to see so many people here and also to make sure all of you know that we run a lot of programs here. This year, I can say that we're open 365 days this year. Usually it's 364, but we get an extra day this year with the leap year. And we run programs both here, as, as you're here with us, and also online. In fact, coming up this week online, we have Folding Fridays. If you've never folded with us online, it's a lot of fun. I hope you'll join us. Friday night, we have a robotics event here. We have robots that sing and dance and sense where they are and uh, probably another sold out event, but there might be a few spaces. Come join us. We have a program for teens and tweens Sunday night. We have topological crochet for those of you who are crafty, that runs online. Programs for little ones, programs for adults only. Please go to events.momath.org to see all the wonderful programs we have, including tonight's program. I am very delighted that we're back in person for our Minds on Math series. This is a series that is the brainchild of Professor Moira, Dill Moira Dillon, and she's an assistant professor at NYU. And a number of years ago, she showed up in town coming from Boston and said, hey, we should work together. I study cognitive psychology and how children perceive math, and we should do some things together. And it has been an absolute pleasure to work with her, and it's really thanks to Moira that we have tonight's speaker with us. So I'm going to turn the mic to her and let her make a more formal introduction. But please give her a huge round of applause for doing this for us. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you, Cindy. Hi, everybody. Uh, so as Cindy mentioned, my name is Moira Dillon. I'm an assistant professor of psychology at NYU. I'm also the director of the Lab for the Developing Mind at NYU. And so, as Cindy uh, uh, pointed to, my lab investigates the origin and development of uniquely human cognition. So from the basic sensitivities of infants, to the untutored use of symbols and language by children, to the high-level concepts of adults. And among those topics, uh, we study humans' unique uh, capacity for mathematics. So it's a quintessential example of human high-level thought. Um, as such, my lab's been collaborating with MoMath since 2017 to conduct fun studies here in the museum uh, with museum visitors, so maybe some of you have participated in those. Um, and these studies look at how mathematical concepts develop. We also run studies nearby at, uh, at the lab at NYU uh, on our campus at Washington Square, and we're always looking for new families who might want to be uh, participants in our studies, for example. Uh, we're currently, yeah, uh, we're currently running an in-person study for seven-month-old infants to see if they can detect parallelism and perpendicularity. So if you know a seven-month-old um, and you think that they might want to participate, <laughs> please find me or one of my lab members after the talk and we'll give you some more information. So the lab and museum also collaborate on uh, programming at the intersection of psychology and mathematics. And that brings us to tonight's talk series, Minds on Math. So Minds on Math is supported by a grant to my lab from the National Science Foundation. It features accomplished scholars in developmental psychology, cognitive science, mathematics, and education who conduct research on how our minds and brains learn and appreciate math and related fields. So this evening, I'm very happy to introduce Stephen Pinker as our Minds on Math speaker. One of today's leading public intellectuals, Steve needs no introduction, as the turnout tonight makes clear. Uh, that's lucky for me because the number of Steve's contributions to science and to public uh, discourse and the myriad awards and recognition for them are too many even to list tonight before the museum closes. Johnstone Professor of Psychology at Harvard University, Steve is an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences. Steve's work has been cutting edge, uh, at the cutting edge of cognitive science from his graduate work on vision, to extensive work on language and its development in children, to recent work on the psychology of common knowledge. So, as in the sentence, I know that you know that I know that you know that Steve is great. <laughs> 
Steve has also taken his uh, work and transformed it into comprehensive accounts of language and of the mind, written up in nine books uh, for a general audience, starting with The Language Instinct in 1994 and continuing today with Rationality, What Is It? Or What It Is, Why It Seems Scarce, and Why It Matters. Steve has a rare ability to write books that are at once accessible to the public and yet also further academic discourse. For example, in his 1997 book, How the Mind Works, it was not only a Pulitzer Prize finalist, but also provoked spirited debate with the cognitive scientist Jerry Fodor, who responded with a book titled, The Mind Doesn't Work That Way, to which Steve reposted with an article he might have titled, No One Ever Said It Did. <laughs> Steve has among his interlocutors people like Jerry Fodor and Bill Gates, who called Steve's 2018 book, Enlightenment Now, my new favorite book of all time. But I can add a personal note that Steve is also very generous with his engagement with his students. For example, Steve was not only on my dissertation committee, he also took time to come hear me practice a talk. It needed some help. <laughs> Which reminds me, Steve is a language maven. He served as chair of the usage panel the American Heritage Dictionary and wrote a wonderful book titled The Sense of Style, which gives practical tips for writing and the science behind them. I've taken Steve's generous teaching to heart, knowing not to say, children were given an age-appropriate, manipulable response indicator, but just say, instead, children were given a stuffed animal. I'm thankful to scholars like Steve, whose brilliance and thought in communication makes science richer and more accessible and society richer as a result. This is why I'm particularly pleased to have Steve here tonight sharing his work. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Steven Pinker. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Dillon. And thanks to all of you for coming. It is a real honor to speak at MoMath. Can you all hear me? Okay, there's the pretty loud HVAC sound, so I'm glad that this, the sound carries. I'm going to speak to you tonight about rationality, which presents something of a puzzle. On the one hand, our species can lay claim to feats of astonishing rationality. We've figured out how to walk on the moon and take pictures of our home planet. We have plumbed the mysteries of the cosmos, the origin of the universe, the nature of life, the circuitry of mind. We have pushed back against the horsemen of the apocalypse, decimating the human toll from scourges, from scourges that have immiserated humanity throughout its existence, such as war, famine, poverty, and child mortality. At the same time, a majority of Americans aged 18 to 24 think that astrology is very or sort of scientific. Large proportions believe in conspiracy theories, such as that the COVID-19 vaccine actually consists of microchips that Bill Gates <laughs> is injecting into our bodies so that he can surveil them. Or that the American deep state houses a cabal of cannibalistic, Satan-worshipping pedophiles. Many people uh, believe in uh, fake news, such as Joe Biden calls Trump supporters dregs of society, or Yoko Ono, I had an affair with Hillary Clinton in the 70s. <laughs> and large proportions believe in paranormal woo-woo, such as possession by the devil, extrasensory perception, ghosts and spirits, witches, and spiritual energy in mountains, trees, and crystals. In my book, Rationality, and in a course that I teach at Harvard, I try to make sense of this tension of how our species can be capable of feats of rationality, but at the same time engage in such uh, flagrant um, uh, quackery. But let me begin at the beginning. What is rationality? And I think the most straightforward definition is it's the use of knowledge to attain goals. And uh, to illustrate this concretely, I'm going to quote from my favorite uh, Quote Meister, William James, the American philosopher and psychologist who gave his name to the building in which I work and in which uh, uh, Professor Dillon was trained, William James Hall. But James tried to put his finger on the difference between a system that we would all 
credit with rationality, namely a human being, and a physical uh, object that seems to exhibit superficially similar behavior, but to which we would deny rationality. And here's how he tries to uh, put his finger on the difference. Romeo wants Juliet, as the filings want the magnet. And if no obstacles intervene, he moves toward her by as straight a line as they. But Romeo and Juliet, if a wall be built between them, do not remain idiotically pressing their faces against the opposite sides like the magnet and filings with the card. Romeo soon finds a circuitous way, by scaling the wall or otherwise, of touching Juliet's lips directly. With the filings, the path is fixed. Whether it reaches the end depend on, depends on accidents. With the lever, it is the end which is fixed. The path may be modified indefinitely. That's rationality. Well, th it then leads to <clears throat> the question, how can knowledge be used to attain goals? And that leads us to the subject of normative models, that is, models from logic and mathematics and uh, science that tell us how we ought to use reason to attain particular goals, to be distinguished from descriptive or psychological models which characterize how people do use reason to uh, attain particular goals. But this sets the, the benchmark, the yardstick for what rationality uh, uh, would be against which we can compare the performance of human beings. As such, it all, the normative models also uh, provide guidelines for how to avoid common fallacies. And indeed, each normative model uh, points to a common way in which human beings flout it. So the most basic of them is logic, which allow us to deduce new true propositions from existing ones and help us to avoid fallacies like affirming the consequent. As in, every creative genius was laughed at in his time. People laugh at my ideas. Therefore, I am a creative genius. <laughs> Probability. The likelihood of an event depends on the number of occurrences as a proportion of the number of opportunities, which allows us to avoid fallacies like the availability bias, so named by the psychologists Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman, uh, in which the subjective likelihood of an event depends on how easily you can recall anecdotes and images from memory. Illustrated in the following SMBC cartoon, the caption is, this is why people should learn statistics, and the character says, I will not fly in a plane, they aren't safe from terrorists. Hold on, I'll text you an article about it. <laughs> this is why people should learn statistics. Bayes' rule, we should give credence to a hypothesis to the extent that it's credible a priori, it's consistent with the evidence, and the evidence is uncommon across the board. Those of you who are familiar with Bayes' rule or Bayes' theorem will recognize this as a verbal reformulation of the mathematical formula. This avoid, helps us to avoid fallacies such as base rate neglect, also identified by Tversky and Kahneman, as in the advice uh, given by a uh, innumerate doctor to a, uh, a, a mother I know who, whose uh, child uh, showed, a two-year-old showed twitches, and he said, oh, uh, she probably has uh, Tourette syndrome, which sent this woman into a momentary panic until she recreated Bayes' rule intu intuitively and realized that lots of kids show twitches not that many people in the population have Tourette syndrome. Therefore, the fact that she shows twitches probably means that she does not have Tourette syndrome. The theory of rational choice or expected utility, discovered by John von Neumann and Oscar Morgenstern, according to which a rational actor should choose the option with the greatest expected utility, and that is the sum of the probabilities of different outcomes times the payoff of those outcomes. And an awareness of expected utility theory it helps us avoid fallacies such as buying extended warranties, which a large proportion of Americans do. Does it really make sense to take out a life insurance policy on your toaster? If you thought about the cost of the policy, the probability your toaster would fail, and the cost of a new toaster, maybe not. And perhaps more consequentially, uh, if you put a uh, subjective value on uh, how much 
uh, pleasure or utility you get from seeing a text or social media t t uh, post uh, 20 seconds early compared to the cost you the value you place on your life as you cross the street reading your smartphone, then maybe that bit of expected utility theory could change your decisions and perhaps save your life. The theory of signal detection theory, or statistical decision theory, they're the same thing. A fallible observer can't know whether an observation is real, namely a signal, or bogus, uh, uh, namely noise, and must set a decision cutoff that trades off misses and false alarms according to their costs. And an intuitive grasp of signal detection theory uh, would help people avoid fallacies such as we should deal with misconduct by making it easier to convict the accused, which indeed will result in more guilty people being punished, and it will also, as a mathematical necessity, result in more innocent people being punished. Game theory, how to make rational choices when the payoffs depend on someone else's rational choices, which can help avoid fallacies like uh, the following, which I heard from one of my colleagues. We could avoid climate change if we just convince everyone that it's just in their interest to conserve because no one wants to live in a hotter world. The problem is that no individual can prevent climate change by uh, reducing his or her um, um, greenhouse gas emissions, nor can a country unless everyone else is doing it at the same time. And if everyone else is reasoning in the same way, then it is not in any individual's rational interest to conserve, even if it is in everyone's rational interest for everyone to conserve. That's the kind of um, paradox that game theory illuminates. Finally, the, the, the seventh normative model that I commend to every educated person is the theory of causal inference. To distinguish causation from correlation, one must manipulate the putative cause, holding all else constant. That helps us to avoid fallacies like failing to rule out confounds. My favorite illustration comes from an old Jewish joke in which a sexually unsatisfied couple approaches their rabbi with their problem. It being written in the Talmud that a man is responsible for his wife's sexual pleasure. This is true. Well, the rabbi strokes his beard and he says, well, here's an idea. You should hire a handsome, young, strapping man to wave a towel over you the next time you make love, and the, the fantasies will, will help, help the missus achieve satisfaction. Well, they hire a young, handsome man, and they follow the rabbi's instructions, and the earth doesn't move. Uh, uh, nothing happens. So they go back to the rabbi. He strokes his beard and he says, well, let's try a slight variation. This time we'll have the young man make love to the wife, and you, the husband, will wave the towel. Well, they try it, and sure enough, she achieves a, an earth-moving, screaming orgasm. And the husband says to the young man, schmuck, now that's the way you wave a towel. <laughs> that, that's an example of failing to rule out a confound. So this is, uh, when I teach a course on rationality, when I wrote my book on rationality, I had a chapter on each of these seven normative models, because I think that they, in the 21st century, these are just tools of thinking that every educated person should, uh, should be second nature to every educated person. But as a psychologist, it raises the question, do um, ordinary human beings follow these normative models of rationality? Let me look at two, uh, uh, two classic cases. These are experiments that uh, forget about the replicability crisis. These have replicated, uh, in some cases, for 60 years. And they, uh, but let, let me uh, work through them with you. So here's an example from logic. Uh, every card has a number on one side and a letter on the other. Here is a possible rule that I would like you all to try to test. If a card has a D on one side, then it has a 3 on the other. What is the smallest number of cards that you have to turn over to verify whether that rule holds of this deck of cards? There's a D, there's an F, there's a 3, there's a 7. So why don't you ponder this for a second. If there's a D on one side, there's a 3 on the other. Every card has a letter on one side and a number on the other. Do you turn over the D, the F, the 3, the 7? Okay. 
turn over the D or turn over the D and the 3? The correct answer is you have to turn over the D and the 7. Why? Well, everyone knows you've got to turn over the D because if there's no 3 on the other side, that falsifies the rule. Everyone knows you don't have to turn over the F. That's irrelevant. A lot of people think you have to turn over the 3, but logically that is uh, irrelevant because the rule says if D, then 3, not if 3, then D. Thinking that you have to turn over the 3 is an example of the logical fallacy of affirming the consequent. And when you think about it, you really do have to turn over the 7 because if it had a D on the other side, that would falsify the rule. If there's a D on one side, there's a 3 on the other. Now, the, a, the conventional explanation for this is that people are subject to a confirmation bias. That is, we are very good at picking out examples that confirm some idea. We, are, uh, we, we tend to be uh, willfully neglectful or lazy when it comes to looking for evidence that might falsify a proposition. Let me give you an example from Bayesian inference, the sometimes called the medical decision-making problem. The probability that a woman has breast cancer is 1%. If she has breast cancer, the probability that she tests positive is 90%. That is the sensitivity or um, a true positive rate. If she does not, the probability that she never, nevertheless tests positive is 9%. That's the false positive rate. A woman tests positive, what is the chance that she actually has uh, the disease? Okay. Well, the most popular answer, including among uh, doctors, is 80 to 90%. The correct answer, according to Bayes' rule, is 9%. That's right your doctor is liable to say that there's a 90% chance that you have a disease, when in reality, there's a 9% chance of having the disease. It's an example of what Tversky and Kahneman call base rate neglect. Namely, people tend to ignore the priors, uh, in this case, the base rate in the population, and they base their judgments on representative stereotypes. So if you have an image of what it's like to, for someone who has the disease, and they almost certainly will test positive, they test positive, you think, OK, they must have the disease. You don't think about how rare uh, it is in the population to begin with. If it is rare, what it means is that most of the positives are false positives. And that is not particularly intuitive. So what do these fallacies show? Uh, well, according to a uh, famous commentator on human rationality, uh, it suggests that humans are irrational, but not so fast. Here is a twist on the logic problem. If a bar patron is drinking beer, he must be over 21. You are a bouncer in a bar, and you have to enforce the rule. Which of the following do you have to check? There's a guy drinking beer. Do you have to card him to make sure he's old enough? There's a guy drinking Coke. Do you have to card him to see if he's old enough? There's a guy who's clearly over 21. Do you have to peer into his cup to see what he's drinking? And there's a guy who's under 21. Do you have to peer into his cup to see what he's drinking? Well, in this case, almost everyone gets it right. Uh, that is, you've got to find out the age of the guy who's drinking beer and the beverage of a person who is under 21. But this is logically isomorphic to the card selection problem. Uh, but now everyone is a logician called the content effect, that people are illogical with abstract symbols, with P's and Q's and X's and Y's, but they can be logical with certain kinds of meaningful content, uh, in this case, obligations and precautions. Let me give you a twist on the probability problem. 10 in every 1,000 women have breast cancer. Of these 10 women, 9 will test positive. Of the 990 women without breast cancer, about 89 will test positive. A woman tests positive, what is the chance that she actually has the disease? Well, now people can think, OK, there are 98 people that test positive. Of those, 9 have cancer. 9 out of 98, about 9%. Uh, so all of a sudden, people are perfectly rational Bayesians. Not only do 87% of doctors get it right, we won't ask too many questions about that, the other 13%. Uh, but even a majority of 10-year-olds get it right. The uh, explanation is that 
uh, we have here a difference between natural frequencies, that is, in a large population, what is the proportion of those individuals that have a particular outcome, versus single event probabilities. What is the quantity between zero and one that applies to that individual? Which is, these are two different definitions of probability. In fact, philosophers of probability often debate which one is uh, more appropriate, which is a better uh, formalization of our intuitive uh, uh, concept of probability. And there's a lot of reason to believe, a lot of evidence, that humans naturally think in terms of uh, relative frequencies, and that the somewhat philosophical question of, does that woman have, what's the probability that, that woman has cancer? Well, kind of either she does or she doesn't. What do you mean the probability that she does? That is a more abstruse concept that is, is uh, less intuitive to people. So I think a better conclusion about human rationality than Mr. Spock's rather uh, cynical conclusion is that people use what we can call ecological rationality. This does not refer to being green or, or, or hugging a tree, but at the sense of rationality as it is applicable in a natural envi human environment. That is, people can reason about content matter, uh, content relative to their lives, commingled with their subject knowledge. Uh, uh, they can estimate probabilities as they encounter sequences of, of events in their lives, uh, a case, then another case, then another case. People have more trouble with formal rationality. That is, abstract rules and formulas that can apply across the board to any content. These are extremely powerful because they, uh, it means that you're equipped to solve problems that you have no experience with, that no one may ever have had any experience with, uh, but they uh, are not what human reason evolved to exploit. They have to be explicitly taught and mastered in school uh, these ha and, and uh, consciously deployed. So that's a, a summary of the major normative models that I think constitute uh, uh, useful rationality and how people conform or fail to conform to them. Uh, but when I told people I was going to teach a course on rationality, and when I then said I'm going to write a book on rationality, people weren't all that uh, curious about you know, Bayes' rule and whether people are Bayesians or not, or, or whether people apply signal detection theory. The question that I always got was, OK, Mr. Professor, if you're going to explain rationality, can you explain why humanity seems to be losing its mind? How do you explain the QAnon and fake news and the uh, COVID conspiracy theories? This turns out is not a straightforward question to answer, although I did my best. And I'm going to give you four reasons why um, I, I think that people, uh, though capable of rationality, often display such flagrant disregard for the canons of rationality. The most obvious is motivated reasoning. That is, the very definition of rationality has it in pursuit of a goal. You're not rational if you just spout um, uh, useless but true statements, say, rattle off all the prime numbers or random theorems that no one much cares about, you're considered to be rational if you use it to achieve some uh, important goal. Now, that goal may not be objective truth. It could be to win an argument in which the stakes matter to you. As Upton Sinclair said, it's very hard to convince a man, get a man to understand something when his livelihood depends on not understanding it. Could be to show how wise and moral your group is, your religion, your tribe, your p political sect, and how stupid and evil the opposite one is. A bias that's been called the my side bias, subject of a, an important book by Keith Stanovich, uh, probably the most robust of the 200 or so biases documented by psychologists, and the, the one bias that is uncorrelated with intelligence. Smart people commit it as much as uh, dull people. Uh, to, uh, and to gain status and avoid ostracism as a hero for your side. So let me give you an example, just to uh, indicate what I have in mind. Uh, I'd like you to judge whether the following syllogism is valid, remembering that valid is not the same as sound. A valid syllogism is one in which the conclusion follows logically from the premises. Premises. 
If college admissions are fair, then affirmative action laws are no longer necessary. College admissions are not fair. Therefore, affirmative action laws are necessary. Well, when you give people this problem, it, um, uh, by the way, it, it is not a valid syllogism. It involves the fallacy of denying the antecedent, similar to affirming the consequent. If you give the test to a politically diverse sample of people, a majority of liberals commit the fallacy and a majority of conservatives do not. Now, if you ask a conservative what is the explanation, they say, well, we told you all along, liberals are irrational. But oh, wait. How about this syllogism? If less severe punishments deter people from committing crime, then capital punishment should not be used. Less severe punishments do not deter people from committing crime. Therefore, capital punishment should be used. Well, I think you know what's coming next. Now, a majority of conservatives commit the fallacy of judging this to be valid. It is, again, invalid because it uh, in involves denying the uh, antecedent. A majority of liberals get it right. Of course, neither side is showing their prowess in logic. Both sides are simply affirming any argument that leads to a conclusion that they want to be true in the first place. There's a second uh, a part of the explanation for why people believe weird things, and it pertains to an area of psychology in which uh, Professor uh, Dillon has worked in that is deeply rooted folk intuitions, core uh, concepts that are just part of the rationality that we might be born with, we might have evolved with. For example, uh, we uh, are all intuitive dualists in the sense that we all feel that a, uh, intuitively that a person has a body and they have a mind. Well, from that intuition, it's a short step to uh, propose that there can be minds without bodies, in which you get s belief in spirits and souls and ghosts and an afterlife and reincarnation and ESP. There's the intuition of essentialism, that living things contain some, an invisible essence that gives them their form and powers. Uh, there's a kernel of truth uh, in that intuition, but from there it is a short step to assume that disease is caused by some kind of adulteration or contamination of one's pure essence by a foreign, foreign contaminant which leads to forms of quackery that have been rediscovered by culture after culture, um, such as um, purging, bloodletting, fasting, and the vague sense that to achieve wellness, you've got to get rid of toxins, whatever they are. But the same intuition, I think, it helps explain um, resistance to vaccines, which is as old as vaccination itself, because intuitively, what is vaccination? It is injecting an actual form of the germ that makes you sick into the tissues of your body. Now, you know, we know from immunology that that's a good thing, not a bad thing, but intuitively, nothing could be more revolting. Uh, or genetically modified organisms, which are uh, perfectly safe, but which make many people squeamish because it seems like adding an artificial, uh, perhaps toxic substance to a pure food. Why people are receptive to homeopathy and herbal remedies, which seem to be transfusing the pure essence of some living, uh, healthful thing uh, into the body. Then there's the intuition of teleology, that our, our own plans and our artifacts and our tools are designed with a purpose. From there, it is a short step to assume that the world is designed with a purpose. And so you have uh, natural belief in creationism, in astrology, in synchronicity, uh, and the, the vague sense that everything happens for a reason. OK, third part of the explanation for why people believe weird things. These deeply rooted folk intuitions are unlearned, and objective truths, that is, by the lights of our best science, are, are acquired only by trusting legitimate expertise. Scientists, historians, uh, responsible journalists, government record keepers. Because after all, even those of us who like to think of ourselves as scientifically literate, we can't really justify most of our beliefs, including the true ones. So I've been, uh, you know, I've been vaccinated you know, multiple times. And if you ask me how do vaccines work, I'd say something like, 
uh, you know, antibodies, yada, 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 immune system, uh, T cells. But you know, I kind of believe those guys in the white coats. Uh, and that's really what belief in the scientific consensus consists of for the vast majority of people. And in fact, uh, tests of scientific literacy both across the board and in specific domains show that the creationists and the climate deniers are no less scientifically literate than believers. So if you ask basic tests like what's bigger, an atom or a molecule, then the percentage of creationists who get that correct is the same as the percentage of believers in evolution who get that correct. The only diff the difference between them is not scientific literacy, it's political ideology. The farther you are to the right, the more you deny evolution, the more you deny uh, anthropogenic climate change. Weird beliefs persist in people who don't trust the establishment, who think of government uh, uh, agents and journalists and scientists and academics as uh, just another tribe uh, and uh, no more or less credible than uh, the, the people who they listen to. Uh, final part of the explanation is that I think part of the answer of, to the question, why do people believe weird things, is kind of depends what you mean by believe. Um, it seems to me that people hold two kinds of beliefs, and this is an idea that I've borrowed from a number of psychologists, um, the social psychologist Robert Abelson and the cognitive psychologists uh, Hugo uh, Mercier and Dan Sperber. There are beliefs in what you can think of as the reality zone, that is the physical objects that you interact with, the other people that you deal with face to face, your own memory of interactions. And here, uh, people's beliefs they treat as um, factual and uh, testable, and people hold them if they're true. They kind of have to, to live a normal human life. It's the only way you can keep food in the fridge and gas in the car, and the kids clothed and uh, fed and off to school on time, is if you respect you know, laws of reality, at least those that impinge on you and your life. But then there's a whole other set of beliefs in what I call the mythology zone. So this would in, uh, comprise the, the distant past, the unknowable future, faraway places and peoples, remote corridors of power, what happens in the White House, what happens in, uh, behind uh, in corporate boardrooms, the microscopic, the cosmic, the counterfactual, the metaphysical. Here, um, people's default attitude is, well, no one knows and no one can know. And they hold beliefs because they're entertaining, they're uplifting, they're empowering, they're morally edifying. Whether they are true or false is unknowable and hence uh, ir irrelevant. And indeed, until recently, uh, the advent of modern science and journalism and record keeping and history, these things were unknowable. Uh, and uh, intuitively, that means you can kind of believe whatever uh, you think is more most uh, uplifting or um, uh, edifying. Examples are religion, which almost by definition consists of beliefs that are held by faith rather than evidence. Uh, myths of the, uh, the, the, the great heroes and martyrs that founded our great nation. Historical fiction, where people aren't particularly bothered by whether you know, uh, uh, Henry V actually said those stirring words that Shakespeare attributed to them. Uh, probably fake news and conspiracy theories, where it's not clear that people are committed to them being fact, but rather um, uh, they reinforce the morality of your own side, and who's to say they're not fact? So to give, give an example, this comes from um, uh, Hugo Mercier. Um, in uh, Pizzagate was the conspiracy theory that eventually spawned QAnon, according to this theory, Hillary Clinton ran a child sex ring out of the basement of a Washington, D.C. pizzeria. Now, uh, how did people who actually held this belief um, act on them? Well, one example is a guy who gave a one-star review to the pizzeria on, on uh, Yelp. Uh, and he said the, uh, the, the dough was, was kind of underbaked and there were some suspicious looking men giving funny looks to my child. Now, this is not the kind of response that you would have if you literally thought that children were being raped in the basement. Presumably, you would call the police. 
But what it suggests is that the belief, what is the belief that, um, or what is the statement, I believe Hillary Clinton ran a child sex ring, really mean? I think a accurate translation is, I believe Hillary Clinton is so depraved that she'd be capable of running a child sex ring, and how can you prove that she didn't? Or an even more accurate translation would be, boo, Hillary. Uh, Pete, that is, beliefs can be expressions of moral convictions. Now, when, uh, for most of us, this is a utterly foreign mindset. Like Bertrand Russell, we might think it is undesirable to believe a proposition when there is no ground whatsoever for supposing it is true. But it turns out this is not an obvious or banal or trite statement. This is a radical, unnatural manifesto. It is a gift of the Enlightenment in which we like to think that all questions are, in principle, objectively answerable, but it is not the intuitive way of, that people hold beliefs, at least beliefs outside of the reality zone in which they uh, conduct their own lives. Well, it naturally leads to the question, how can we become more rational? And um, I think it begins with making the tools of former rationality second nature, that rationality uh, should be the fourth R, together with reading, writing, and arithmetic. And the, uh, the Museum of Mathematics has an obvious role to play in that. Uh, as does satire, as in the Onion headline, CDC sounds, announces plan to send every US household pamphlet on probabilistic thinking. Also, um, it isn't just a question of education, though, but the norms of rationality should just be kind of second nature. They should be part of conventional wisdom, of the ground rules for debating and arguing, uh, that uh, avoiding fallacies like the availability bias, the my side bias, arguing ad hominem should be just promoted as common uh, decency. And the Basing beliefs on evidence, changing your mind when the evidence changes, should be seen as signs of strength, uh, not weakness. Now, of course, it's hard to engineer norms from the top down, but to the extent that we can encourage these in our uh, everyday interactions, we ought to. Um, perhaps most important, institutions with rationality promoting rules must be safeguarded. Now, in an institution, one person can notice and make up for another person's biases, and they can make us collectively more rational than any of us is individually. Um, for example, in research on that card selection task, the uh, if D then three, when people work alone, about one in 10 get it right, but if you put people in groups of three or four, about seven out of 10 groups get it right, all it takes is for one person to spot the correct answer, and they almost always convince the other people in the group. So people can recognize rationality when it's pointed out to them. Well, what do I mean by rationality promoting institutions? These are institutions that are designed so that one person's rationality can make up for another person's irrationality, that are explicitly designed to seek truth such as science with its demand for empirical testing and peer review, democratic government with its checks and balances, journalism with its demands for editing and fact-checking, the judicial system with its adversarial proceedings, academia with, at least in theory, in principle, uh, ideally with its commitment to freedom of inquiry and open debate, uh, whether it is in practice is uh, another question for another night. Uh, even Wikipedia, one of the success stories of the internet, uh, is surprisingly accurate because Wikipedians are committed to pillars of neutrality and uh, objectivity, and that guides their day-to-day -day, um, uh, activity. You can compare social media without explicit um, mechanisms to, uh, uh, to um, uh, favor truth, such as, you know, X and uh, Facebook and uh, TikTok, and uh, needless to say, if the safeguards aren't in place, people's natural tendency would be to share various kinds of uh, untruths and rumors. Uh, it also means that the credibility and objectivity of these institutions ought to be safeguarded. That is, that experts should not uh, 
speak as if they are oracles, if they, as if they are infallible or omniscient, but be prepared to show their work, to show that the credibility of the institution rests on the methods that it uses to ascertain uh, truth. Fallibility should be acknowledged, otherwise as soon as uh, any expert is shown to be wrong, which inevitably they will because no one is infallible, then that would take down the credibility of the whole institution unless they emphasize that it is in a continual process of seeking truth, not of just transmitting it. And I think most important is gratuitous politicization should be uh, avoided. Increasingly, our scientific magazines, our scientific institutions brand themselves as uh, advocates of the political left. When they do it, they should not be surprised when the political center and the political right blows them off. And uh, that is, I think, the, the uh, biggest threat to scientific literacy today. How are we doing for time? Can I, a little more? Okay. Finally, why rationality matters? Well, rationality matters to our lives. And there are, uh, are um, Studies that show that people who follow the normative models and avoid these cognitive biases, the ones that I began the talk with, on average get into fewer accidents and mishaps. They are, uh, uh, as I put it, less likely to be schlamazels. They have uh, better financial health and employment outcomes. And of course, they're less likely to be swindled by medical or psychic charlatans. Um, I have argued that rationality drives material progress. In an earlier book, Enlightenment Now, I presented data that longevity, peace, prosperity, safety, and quality of life have all increased over time, on average, not everywhere uh, all the time, which leads to a frequently asked question, do you believe in progress? And the answer is, uh, that I give is no. Uh, that is, echoing the humorous Fran Leibowitz, I don't believe in anything you have to believe in. That progress is, there is not any force that just magically uh, lifts us upward. On the contrary, the forces of, of uh, nature tend to kind of grind us down. The only reason that we've enjoyed progress is from our ancestors deploying reason to improve human flourishing. That is, identifying problems, using reason to try to solve them. If we remember the things that work, try not to repeat our mistakes, then bit by bit, we can eke out progress. Finally, and this is how I'll uh, end the talk, um, I'd be prepared to argue that rationality drives moral progress. And this is an argument that <clears throat> kind of occurred to me when writing still another book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, Why Violence Has Declined, where I showed by a number of measures, uh, barbaric practices have declined over the course of history. What I discovered to my, my own surprise is that many moral movements to abolish abominable practices began with a rational argument that um, some thinker or moralist or philosopher or theologian would lay out an argument as to why some practice of the day was indefensible or irrational or inconsistent with values that people claim to hold. Their uh, essay would go viral. It, as we would say today, it would get translated into many languages, um, published as uh, pamphlets get debated in pubs and salons and coffee houses uh, and dinner parties and eventually influence leaders and legislators and popular opinion, then the conclusion could get absorbed into conventional wisdom and become just the common decency of the era, uh, erasing the tracks of the original argument that got us there. Uh, let me give you some examples. Uh, and I, I don't think I could prove this with uh, data, but these are at least uh, compelling historical case studies. So did people really need a rational argument as to why um, religious persecution, like burning heretics at the stake, uh, might be wrong? Well, they did. And it was provided, among others, by Sebastian Castellio in the 16th century. He said, Calvin says that he is certain and other sects say that they are. Who shall be judge? In view of the uncertainty, we must define the heretic simply as one with whom we disagree. If then we're going to kill heretics, the logical outcome will be a war of extermination, since each is sure of himself. In other words, uh, 500 years before cognitive psychologists started talking about the my side bias, Castellio identified it as a human frailty. What about 
cruel forms of corporal and capital punishment, like uh, breaking on the wheel, clawing with iron hooks, disembowelment, burning at the stake. Did people really need a rational argument as to why something might be a, a, a wee bit wrong with uh, tearing someone to pieces as a form of criminal punishment? Well, they did, and it was provided by Cesare Beccaria, the uh, economist and sociologist who founded utilitarianism, who argued as punishments become more cruel, the minds of men, which like fluids always adjust to the level of objects that surround them, become hardened. And after 100 years of cruel punishments, breaking on the wheel causes no more fear than imprisonment previously did. For a punishment to achieve its objective, it is only necessary that the harm it inflicts outweighs the benefit that derives from the crime. And into this calculation ought to be factored the certainty of the punishment and the loss of the good that the commission of the crime would produce. Anything beyond this is superfluous and therefore tyrannical. In other words, Beccaria anticipated the theory of rational choice or expected utility, and his arguments eventually led to the abolition of torture, uh, as in our eight, the Eighth Amendment to the American Constitution, prohibiting cruel and unusual punishment. What about war? Did uh, people need an argument as to why war is, as we used to say in the 60s and 70s, unhealthy for children and other living things? Well, Erasmus provided it in the 15th century. He said, the advantages derived from peace diffuse themselves far and wide and reach great numbers, while in war, if anything turns out happily, the advantage redounds only to a few. One man's safety is owing to the destruction of another. One man's prize is derived from the plunder of another. The cause of rejoicings made by one side is to the other a cause of mourning. Whatever is unfortunate in war is severely so indeed, and whatever, on the contrary, is called good fortune is a savage and a cruel good fortune, an ungenerous happiness deriving its existence from another's woe. In other words, Erasmus anticipated the concept of a zero-sum game, argued that war was zero-sum and therefore to be avoided. Uh, autocracy, the divine right of kings, even our, our craziest leaders no longer advocate that. Well, as John Locke pointed out, we are born free as we are born rational. Freedom of men under government is to have a standing rule to live by, common to every one of that society and made by the legislative power erected in it. A liberty to follow my own will in all things where that rule prescribes not, not to be subject to the inconstant, uncertain, unknown, arbitrary will of another man, as freedom of nature is to be under no other restraint but the law of nature. It was this line of reasoning against absolute authority that led to uh, democracy, as in the uh, uh, American Declaration of Independence, something that Locke might have anticipated. What he might not have anticipated is how his argument was co-opted by Mary Astell, the first English-speaking feminist, who wrote, if absolute sovereignty be not necessary in a state, how comes it to be so in a family? Or if in a family, why not in a state? Since no reason can be alleged for the one that will not hold more strongly for the other. If all men are born free, how is it that all women are born slaves? As they must be if the being subjected to the inconstant, uncertain, unknown, arbitrary will of men be the perfect condition of slavery. In other words, she was insisting on logical coherence as a criterion for uh, the moral commitment of women's equality. And finally, speaking of slavery, it might seem monstrous, monstrous to us today that anyone should be called on to provide rational arguments for why uh, this most evil institution is evil. But Frederick Douglass uh, did exactly that in, uh, a, uh, in, in many writings, and I'll just give one pithy uh, excerpt. There are 72 crimes in the state of Virginia, which if committed by a black man, subject him to the punishment of death, while only two of the same crimes will subject a white man to the like punishment. What is this but the acknowledge, acknowledgement that the slave is a moral, intellectual, and responsible being? the manhood of the slave is conceded. It is admitted in the fact that the southern statute books are covered with enactments forbidding, under severe fines and penalties, the teaching of the slave to read or to write. 
When you can point to any such laws in reference to the beasts of the field, then I may consent to argue the manhood of the slave. Again, holding the uh, slave de slavery defenders of the day to the standards of logical coherence and consistency. Um, I'm prepared to argue that not only has reason guided movements for change, but reason should guide movements for change. It makes the difference between moral force and brute force, between marches for justice and lynch mobs, between human progress and uh, breaking things. And an appeal to reason will be needed to ensure that moral progress will continue, that some of the abominable practices of today will be seen by our descendants with as much incredulity as we look at uh, burnings at the stake and slave auctions today. Finally, the power to, of rationality to guide moral progress, uh, I'm prepared to say is of a piece with its power to guide material progress and wise choices in our life. And the way I end the book uh, is as follows. Our ability to eke increments of well-being out of a pitiless world and to be good to others despite our flawed nature depends on grasping impartial principles that transcend our parochial experience. We are a species that has been endowed with an elementary faculty of reason and is, that has discovered formulas and institutions that magnify its scope. They awaken us to ideas and expose us to realities that confound our intuitions but are true for all that. Thank you. We have, we have time for a couple questions. You can raise your hand and I will bring a microphone to somebody and I'll start here. So we live in a time now with uh, artificial intelligence is taking over more and more aspects of our, of our lives. And I'm curious, how do you see generative artificial intelligence factoring into what you said about rationality and irrationality, I could envision it could be, the needle could be moved either way. What's your view on that? Yes, so it's a, a, a very apt question, one that I do uh, mention in the, in the book, because there, is, um, there are two kind of styles of artificial intelligence. There's the kind of good old fashioned artificial intelligence, which operates much like logic by uh, applying rules of inference to symbolic formulas. Then there's the kind that really has taken over since the great AI awakening of about a decade ago of artificial neural networks that uh, operate statistically by aggregating almost inconceivable numbers of uh, minute probabilistic generalizations and then aggregate them. Uh, that has shown to be more useful than um, uh, the, the old deductive style of AI. On the other hand, any user of these generative models knows that they are all also prone to hallucinations and falsehoods because there is no, they have no explicit representations of propositions that uh, it can evaluate as true or false. So we do see the two real, really long traditions of different styles of rationality at play in the evolution of artificial intelligence. One of them is now raced ahead, but I think as people uh, both fear the, uh, some of the misuse of current generative AI uh, as they uh, uh, do not start to trust them, as, as I don't. I don't use it as a research tool because I just never know whether to believe any of the results. It could be made up. Uh, I, I asked uh, ChatGPT about myself, and about three out of every 10 statements were just total nonsense. Uh, actually, I shouldn't say total nonsense. They were statistical aggregates of things that have been written about me on the web, mashed up, which are plausible but just false. Such as I was a PhD student of Stephen Jay Gould. Um, uh, kind of ironic since he and I were kind of intellectual adversaries, but our names appeared close enough together in print often enough. And you know, who's to, you know, who's to say they weren't? And that way they do duplicate a certain aspect of human intelligence, namely, kind of mashing things up and believing things if they're plausible, even if they aren't vetted fact. So together with, with others, I tend to, uh, such as Gary Marcus, who is a former colleague of, uh, of Molly Dillon's at NYU, 
uh, one of the fiercest critics of AI, we may have to await a kind of a neurosymbolic or hybrid symbolic and um, probabilistic AI that can do the rapid search and common sense of probabilistic reasoning, but while still having a commitment to truth and falsity. Yeah, there, over here, uh, there actually seems to be sort of a, a, uh, a context issue because these days people seem almost addicted to being outraged and they get morally outraged that makes it impossible for them to reason correctly. And there's almost a business model involved in that with fake news and all that sort of stuff. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on how to combat that. Yeah, no, it, it's a, a profound question that our, our natural tendency to treat um, factual statements as moral acts. That is, uh, if, if someone says something, rather than evaluating with whether, whether what they say is true or false according to our best evidence, we often treat it as a judgment as to whether they're a good or a bad person. Uh, now that is uh, uh, kind of inimical to ideals of science, academia, uh, uh, jurisprudence, um, good governance, but it is a natural human tendency that I think we've seen an increase of in the rise of cancel culture, of um, social media mobbing, of you can't say that, of you know that's not funny. Um, and th that has, I think, subverts the mission, especially of universities, but also of uh, journalism. Uh, I don't think we've discovered the appropriate way to push back, but uh, there, has been, there have been people making the argument that facts don't care about your feelings, that there is virtue in um, encouraging free speech, which allows uh, fallible people to point out what is, fa what is wrong with other people's arguments. Uh, but it is uh, a, an effort that will always have to push back against the natural tendency that we have, at least in outside of our day-to-day -day experience, to treat factual statements as uh, moral, um, uh, moral giveaways, moral litmus tests. Hi, yes. this has been a very fun, fast-paced, wonderful talk. Um, let's bring color to the AI conversation. Self-driving cars. In that moment, the car's about to hit the grandma walking the street <laughs> or saving the person in the car. How do you teach a computer rationality? Yes, this is, there is a, uh, a movement for of, uh, uh, kind of trolley problems for autonomous vehicles. You know, by and large, so I, a, a former student of mine, Julia De Freitas, now a professor at the Harvard Business School, has written on, um, on uh, these uh, trolley problems for autonomous vehicles. And he actually interviewed the, the engineers who design autonomous vehicles. They don't, in fact, give a lot of thought to trolley problems. They just don't want the cars to collide with you know, anyone ever at any time. And so avoiding the collision is really what they're, they're, uh, they're programmed to, uh, to do. But you know, ultimately, if in the tiny number of edge cases where a collision can't be prevented and it's a question of uh, 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 who gets sacrificed. As generations of philosophy students have debated in terms of whether you can divert a trolley to uh, prevent the deaths of five workers on the track at the cost of killing one worker on the track, uh, you know, there, there would have to be some kind of commitment to that. You know, I, again, I'm not sure that they'll actually program that in just because the cases are so rare and the, uh, that anything that, also anything that they would announce publicly could be bad publicity for the company. That is, do you, who would buy a car that was programmed to sacrifice the driver to save pedestrians? Uh, you know, am I going to get him, you know, pay $50,000 for a car that's programmed to you know, devalue my life? On the other hand, what kind of monster would sell a car that is programmed to kill pedestrians? So I think they you know, would like for this discussion not to be, if they make these decisions at all, and probably they don't come up all that often in reality uh, for it you know, not to be known what their policy is. Hi, Professor. Here. Okay, yes. Uh, so in the beginning, you mentioned uh, what I used to call, like, I like to call the tragedy of the commons, where it's not rational for every individual actor to act in a certain way, like with climate change, right? Yes, uh, so that's in the case of, uh, I, I call it the, the tragedy of the car carbon commons. Right, yeah. the carbon commons. Uh, so then, do you think that rationality is optimal for every individual player? Like, to give a very crude example, if me and my younger brother were fighting, 
he would just cry out and that would be completely irrational. It doesn't get him what he wants, but perhaps my parent steps in and he gets what he wants. And he's acting irrational, he's not being logical, he's not acting mathematically, but it's still placed to his advantage. So do you think rationality is optimal for every single individual? Yeah, so here's the, uh, I, I, that, it's a profound question and game theory is what makes this, this contrast salient. This is why, you know, I don't, I don't hold out hopes that everyone's going to become a, a, you know, a game theoretician. It's too hard. Um, but just th that way of thinking, just being con familiar with concepts like zero-sum, non-zero-sum games, win-win uh, situation, tragedy of the commons, prisoner's dilemma, uh, chicken game of chicken, uh, allows us to think through these dilemmas, including in the case of the prisoner's dilemma, tragedy of the commons, uh, public goods games, all kind of versions of the same concept. What's rational for each individual can be irrational for everyone acting in concert. In The Prisoner's Dilemma, the two partners in crime doing what's best for them end up in the worst situation for the two of them. Now, you could say, well, does that show that we shouldn't be rational? I think the, a better way of thinking it, of it is that we have to be, in a sense, meta-rational, recognize when we are in a tragedy of the commons, a prisoner's dilemma, and change the rules of the game or change the payoffs in the four cells of the matrix so that we're no longer in a prisoner's dilemma because there is no solution to a prisoner's dilemma, but there is the possibility when you realize that we're in a prisoner's dilemma of changing the payouts so that we're no longer in one. And the, in the example of uh, the, the tragedy of the car carbon commons where it's in every country's interests to let all the other countries conserve and, uh, le and um, uh, enjoy all the benefits of abundant uh, energy, it would be um, uh, mutual agreements such as the Paris Climate Accords that stakes every country's reputation on voluntarily limiting their uh, emissions with the incentive that to the extent that everyone is concerned about their reputation, uh, then everyone can lower it simultaneously. More effective, of course, within the boundaries of a single country where you can ch get people out of a tragedy of the commons with, a, with carbon pricing, like a carbon tax, which changes the payoff so it's no longer rational for each individual to uh, emit as much as they want. But anyway, it, it is a, a profound issue, and I would appeal to the fact that rationality is recursive in the sense that you can always, whenever there is an apparent failure of rationality, where applying these rules leads to an absurd conclusion, you can step back, rationally analyze that normative model, uh, put it into context, and use some other normative framework to circumvent it. And that's why I think rationality, in the end, always wins. So I'm sorry that we don't have any time for any more questions. Uh, Stephen will be up front to sign books that you can buy uh, at our entry. Let's give one more hand to Dr. Pinkman. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Thank and you thank much. you for thank coming. You. Thank you. Good night, and we will see you at the next MoMath.